welcome to Ask the Manager. We're here at Town Hall out in the gardens and it's a beautiful day. Once again, we lucked out. We were thinking about where we could be outside and thought there's no better place than this garden. So we came back to it. And so I'd like to ask you about, um, there were a lot of letters to the selectmen regarding issues about the lake. Is it that they need more law enforcement? Is there a lot of issues? Yeah, so I think it's a combination this year. Um, we, um, boating is a good socially distant activity for the most part. Um, but over the past few years, there has been a lot of activity on the lake and um, we've been looking to both increase Shrewsbury's presence on our boat and have more officers out there more frequent and get a uh, better partnership, honestly, from the city of Worcester and environmental police. It's tough to do it on our own. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a work in progress. We do need more police presence because of the activity. It's mainly maintaining public safety out there. Um, a lot of folks don't follow the rules on the uh, your, the rules of the water and the speed limits and things like that. So it can become dangerous, um, and it's seemed even more so this summer because of the uh, increase in usage of the lake. And um, but it's something we're definitely working with the Lake Quinsigamond Association on, and the residents that are interested, which most are, around the lake to to try to increase our presence. Do you get? cooperation from the city of Worcester or more cooperation than we used to get? Yes, we are. We're on the right path with them over the last few years in partnership uh, with the city manager's office. We've been meeting with them directly and um, they have a public safety boat that's manned or operated out of the fire department. Uh, it's the dive platform that's used, you know, in rescue situations for the lake. So, uh, but they've had a greater presence this summer and um, like I said, we're looking to increase our presence, providing consistency uh, with the amount of officers that we have on our boat and the time that we're out there during peak activity times of the weekend is really important and that's what we're focusing on. I noticed that there's boats on the lake, there are boats on the lake even at seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And that's different than what it used to be. Yeah. So the people that live along the lake I know they have expectations that people are going to be using the lake, but it's got to be frustrating. Yeah, and I think that just goes along with, you know, as you know, like me, you know, a lot of people are doing more staycations, more local vacations, and um, it's a great place to put the boat in the water. There's two public boat launches and uh, a lot of parking which is good for the boaters, but, you know, definitely drives up the volume of boats on the lake. And, you know, people want to get a full day in. You do have to, you know, pay a ramp fee when it's uh, staffed. So um, looking to get the most out of their money and be out on the lake for the full day. So, yeah, and activities expanded into the night, you know, which is a little more concerning. And then especially if you have individuals who aren't very courteous about the volume of their music and the activities that are going on in their boat, those are the things that we're really looking to uh, inform and reduce the, the nuisance of. How's the quality of the water this summer on the lake? Yeah, we, yeah I mean, Lake quinsigamond has been rather good. I mean, knock on wood, we haven't had any sanitary sewer overflows. Um, we have been doing our normal monitoring and we haven't had any E. coli or any other uh, issues within the lake despite it being very dry. That's obvious. That's often a very challenging year whenever there's not a lot of rain and, you know, uh, replenishment and turnover of the water. Um, but Lake Quinsigamond has been open uh, almost entirely, if not the, the whole summer. We haven't had to close any swimming areas down. Um, we have in, in other parts, Dean Park and some of the other smaller bodies of water, whenever you have geese in the area, that increases contaminants and we've had to close them down. Not that they're swimming bodies, but you know, people allow their animals, dogs to go in the water and we want to make sure they're aware of what's going on. Are there any decisions yet on whether there's going to be a boat parade? Uh, I haven't, uh, there, so there's not a, the, the normal fall boat parade will not be happening through Won't the Watershed be. Association, right. 
Yeah. And uh, speaking of animals, you know, we used to have pigeons, and now we have turkeys. I think they were on new pigeons because we were eating supper last night, and I turned around, and there were there was a mother turkey and a um, baby sitting on my railing of my deck. Oh, so you. they're coming closer and closer to the house. Yeah. So I think they're starting to act like they're pigeons. You know, they're not afraid of people and, and they just hang out. Yeah, we certainly have had the turkeys in the center of town. They haven't been a big issue recently, but yeah, a lot of wildlife still in the area. I was at a funeral once when the turkeys took over the, the main street. And it was actually funny to see these turkeys just looking at the cars like, what are you, what are you, what are you bothering me for? This is my territory. So it, it's, it is, it can be funny, but it also can be frustrating once again. So um, also Sewell Pond, the people on Sewell Pond have issues with um, weeds. And oh, yeah, I Jordan. know they came to the Lake Quinsigamon Commission. Yeah. Has anything happened? Or Newton Pond, right? With Newton yeah, Pond? Yeah. Um, so additional funding was provided um, in the appropriations to the Lake Quinsigamon Commission at the annual town meeting, $10,000 more this year than last year. The sole purpose is um, removing invasives. So we are working on a plan through the Conservation Commission. It is a, the town, uh, town Conservation Commission has control of that entire body of water. So um, we'll be doing the winter drawdown and then, you know, chemical treatment to um, reduce the invasives there. It's the headwaters of Lake Quinsigamond. So what flows from there flows into the main body. So, uh, yep, it's something we're definitely focused on. And it is a body of water that many people are using and more people are using because you do see more people with kayaks on yep. that pond. Yep. And it, it's a beautiful pond. So it, it is good that they'll be yep. um, treating it so, so that yeah. they can keep the weeds down. It's a really nice body of water. I was able to go out with some of the residents last fall, uh, last summer, and um, it's, it's nice. And, yeah. and there's a lot of weeds and that provides you know, danger and issues for boaters and kayakers. And, uh, we, and just the overall quality of the water and life living on and around that water body. And yeah, we're looking to help the residents out. And Shrewsbury got a Green Communities Grant yeah, we received word earlier this week, we received almost $200,000 in additional funding. So that program has really paid off. Um, geez, we gotta be over a half a million dollars already or, or pretty close to that in funding for projects. The vast majority of those funds will go to um, the replacement of the uh, Parker Road school roof. Uh, town meeting appropriated $500,000 for that, and then the balance of the funds will come from that Green Communities Act. So uh, Keith Baldinger and Angela Snell have done a lot of work with Green Communities and managing that program along with the Kristen Last, the assistant town manager. So yeah, they're very successful in this grant application. It also has some smaller projects related to lighting improvements in some of the schools. So And those lighting improvements will actually ultimately save the town money. Absolutely, yep. The, all these projects, especially with the grant funding, have a uh, short turnaround time as far as the payback period. And um, so we're getting the environmental and financial benefit, uh, both aspects through this grant application. You must be relieved that town meeting went off so smoothly and it was such a success. Yeah, we're very happy about the way that it went. Um, not only the physical layout, but town meeting members' willingness to work with us on the procedures that we used, which were quite different, and bundling articles. Everyone was there timely. We had 155 town meeting members there, which is a, which is a great number. It's a little less than the average over the course of the two or three days of the annual town meeting in, in recent past, but it's a very strong number in the, given the circumstances. Uh, not only with COVID, but just the fact that it was a Saturday morning in August. And um, yeah, I think we learned a lot of lessons. The Board of Selectmen actually had a conversation at their meeting last Tuesday about some of the things that they're looking to continue. Clusters? Uh, yeah, clusters of voting and articles to help with the efficiencies, you know. Um, and quite frankly, part of the conversation, which they're a little 
less certain about, which I think is, is the right approach to take, is the day and time of town meeting. Um, are we able to continue to hold it on a Saturday? Uh, would that uh, attract more town meeting members because it may be easier to get childcare, for instance, on a Saturday one-shot deal than say, well, it's going to be Tuesday and it might also be Wednesday. Will it be Thursday? Um, so one and done is something that I think is attractive to uh, on a lot of fronts and we're going to see if we can continue that. So um, yeah, a lot of things to think about and I have to admit I got a little anxiety earlier in this week thinking about we really need to get going on a fall town meeting. <laughs> um, and what approach are we going to take on that? Uh, you know, traditionally we have it mid to late October, so we don't want it to go late October. You know, I think the weather temperature wise obviously declines, but um, it's something that we're thinking about already. So. Would you have it outside once again and go through the expense of the tenting and well, I think outside, yes. Uh, I don't see the ability to really, well, we, ha we have to think about it. We have to look at the seating inside. Um, I would like to avoid the expense of the tent, but to be quite honest, um, whenever we need a sound system and we need SMC's equipment to be there and we need everyone to hear and potentially see uh, monitors and screens. You can't really set all that stuff out without s some minimal climate control, i.e. don't let it get wet if it rains. So unfortunately, it might be something that we have to go through the expense again in the fall. You know, it did cost about $30,000. We haven't been shy of, of talking about that. Um, but maybe we'll get away with just doing it twice or maybe we can find an alternative. I would love to really plan for it, you know, same location or similar location outside without a tent, but I would be worried about, you know, we'd be really weather dependent if that was the case. So if we continue with the drought, you, you'll be all, you're all set. <laughs> Something good about a drought, right? I guess, right. A beautiful but I mean, fall day. Yeah, I mean, look at tomorrow, though, you know, with the remnants of the hurricane was supposed to be passing through, right. and it's just supposed to be a complete washout. Now, I don't know if we'd have it if we had the tent anyhow, but it would certainly preclude it if we didn't. You just don't know. Right. So right. something to think about. We made a lot of friends where I was sitting because we were brushing ants off one another. The ants didn't like that we took over their territory. Yeah, they seem to have a pretty stronghold on that front lawn of oak. Yeah. Yeah. So. I thought it went off quite smoothly. Uh, there was a lot of satisfaction, a lot of chatter about people being happy with the way it all played out. It was well thought out and well planned. So oh, thank you. hats off to everyone for that. You have a job opening? Yeah, we have a... Uh... A position in the town manager's office. It's uh, the assistant to the town manager position. It's a management analyst. Um, <coughs> David Snowden held that position prior to his promotion up to the DPW division uh, business manager position. So um, <coughs> it's really a <coughs> critical person on, within the office of the town manager. They do a lot of the front end work on the budget and um, look to expand uh, the town's utilization of data in our decision-making processes. So um, we're really excited to have the opening and bring someone new on. And um, I'm excited for the position. It, it's, you know, earlier in my career, it was a position that, and a position title that I readily sought out. It gets you in the door um, and allows you to really understand the operations of the office of the town manager really well and, and contribute, be a, be a big contributor to uh, the mission of our office and, and work across all departments, both on the budget and, and through other initiatives. So yeah, we're really excited about it. Along with you, Dan Morgado and um, Larry, um, now I'm blanking on his name, who um, went, he's in Auburn. He was, uh, anyways, it'll come to me. And Michael Hale yeah. <laughs> was an assistant to the town manager. Yeah. So clearly. Um, yeah. Oh, Billy Keegan. Billy Keegan, was here. right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, they all didn't run away. They all kind of stayed with local uh, municipal government. Right. So yeah, it's a position. Definitely, you know, a launching point. You know, we 
we want to retain someone as long as possible, but it's certainly well within our thought process when we hire someone that it's um, a good opportunity for succession planning from within a lot of promotional opportunities after, you know, two, three, five years. Um, so, yeah, definitely great. Now, there's a lot of weeds along Route 9, right along the median. Why doesn't the state do anything to keep, keep the town looking beautiful? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a good question, to be honest. I don't have an answer. <clears throat> Well, I have to listen to my husband because okay. he, he cries about it every time we go up Route 9. Yeah. And he brought up a good point. He, he is concerned that we're required as a municipal, municipal government to street sweep twice a year. Right. And part of those weeds are growing in what they don't street sweep. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. I mean, it's something we can reach out to Division 3, uh, uh, Mass DOT to look for some assistance on um, but it is their roadway to maintain and thank you we'll, we'll um... <clears throat> and then um, also the runoff we're very concerned with our runoff into the lake we need to be sure that the state is concerned about their runoff into the lake because they have going just through um, town what really three major highways yeah so our it is, it is, that's very true. And it is one good part of the stormwater permit and the fact that it comes from the federal government is that um, the state has to be our partner in it. And every place that we interconnect into their stormwater system and vice versa, it has to be documented. And each party is responsible for maintaining the permit standards. So um, we're still in that investigatory and documentation phase, you now moving into the second year of the utility. And uh, we have a lot of interconnections along those highways and, and in other parts of the town with the, with the Commonwealth. And they have stepped up and, and been a part of that conversation and work for stormwater. Now, I just want you, are you satisfied with the Board of Health working with the city of Worcester? I think we do a great job, yeah. Um, I really like the model, and um, I'm advocating for that model statewide, honestly. As I mentioned on here before, I was fortunate to be appointed to a statewide commission on public health, and one of the recommendations from the subcommittee that I worked on was replicating models like we have here in Shrewsbury across the state to help communities find ways to get more uh, public health activities going on and manage their core responsibilities and actually allow us to expand the best practices and standards that we use for public health. So uh, the city's been very responsive. Um, I think that the partnership through this point has really paid the most benefits to the community in proactive public health, thing, proactive public health activities. Um, but really, the public health nursing and the contract tracing um, that has gone on during COVID-19, um, they haven't missed a beat. And, and managing Worcester alone is, is a challenge for them, um, but they've done a, a great job. They've been very responsive. More recently, they've been providing almost uh, twice a week data to Dr. Sawyer and his team as they're going through their decision-making processes and working with the teachers and reopening the schools. And um, so we're not lacking for information. I've been very pleased with Karen Clark and, and her whole team and how they support the town. Well, my compliments to um, the city for their contribution and their commitment to us. I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a chance. The infection control nurse was coming out in me <clears throat> everywhere I went about a month ago, and I kept seeing violations. So maybe five or six different places, and finally I said, I'm going to call the Board of Health and see what kind of a response I get. So I explained, I'm sorry, it's the infection control nurse in me, but these are the things I see that you may want to know about. I went back to some of those areas and there were corrections made. Great. So they not only listened, they responded and followed up. 
and um, I give them a lot of credit for that because they must be so busy with yep. all that's happening, but yet they were able to follow up with the issues that I saw. Some of them were simple, basic people type issues, yep. and others were related to health care that yep. I saw, and they, they addressed it. So yeah, I, they I would, advocate for us. Yeah, I would be remiss too. You know, we, we still have one dedicated Shrewsbury employee, Carrie Stockwell. Uh, she manages the office here um, and all the activities and the coordination with the city of Worcester and um, the inspectors from the city and, and points them in the direction that they need to go. She answers my questions and, and everyone else's questions. She manages all those things. I'm, I'm sure Carrie was the one that you likely spoke with and made that happen. And um, she does a fantastic job. It's, yep. it's, a big, it's a big task for one person, but she handles it with ease. Yep. Yep. When you talk about contact tracing, that is an absolute nightmare for someone to have to follow up with all of that and all of the calls and, and all of the backup that goes along with that. Yep. So they, they've had an awful lot of work to do. And I do have to say that because I work professionally with a lot of these boards of health, I'm very confident with what they're telling us and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've done a really good job. Yeah. So I think we're fortunate that we've had that connection and that partnership. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we really are. There's no doubt about it. Speaking of COVID, um, we have 371. That's correct. <clears throat> four cases. Um, four cases isn't bad. We'd like zero, but right. four cases um, is all headed in the right direction. And we've had a steady number, haven't yep. we? Yeah, we've been very steady over the past three or four weeks now. Um, we got back up into the neighborhood of one case per day um, in late July, early August, kind of when everyone else was going, whoa, what's going on? Um, and then the governor kind of ramped, you know, pushed things back a little bit. And we've really seen uh, the effect of that decision. And I think it's been really good. Um, I encourage everyone to go to the state's website and find that interactive local map. Um, I shared it with the Board of Selectmen at their meeting on Tuesday, but you can see the total number of tests, the total tests in Shrewsbury in the last week, and what the trajectory of those tests are. Um, and fortunately, the uh, percentage of positive tests from those cases, uh, or from those tests, are going down. And that's certainly something that we want to continue to see. It gives us a lot of confidence in bringing kids back to the classroom and um, moving in the right direction. You know, it really does take everyone doing their part. Whenever we look at the numbers on a widespread scale, um, you know, it's not just if you have a kid going back or if you're, you know, part of the, the senior population. It's everyone working together to make sure that we keep the numbers down. Are there a lot of people expressing concern locally for students going back to school and teachers going back to school? I mean, I think there's um, similar concern in Shrewsbury as there is in a lot of um, jurisdictions across the state. I wouldn't want to be Dr. Sawyer or Mr. Collins or anyone on the school administration team right now. They certainly have a, a challenging task ahead of them. Uh, and, and and they've been working on it for several weeks and ensuring this integration between the facilities, public facilities, I, I gotta thank Keith Baldinger and Angela Snell again, uh, and their teams for all the work that they're doing in preparing the schools and meeting you know, the public health standards and, and requests of the teachers. Um, and then just putting it all together with you know, the educational opportunities, curriculum, you know, like I said, I don't envy Dr. Sawyer right now. He's got a lot on his plate. Um, they've worked very well, been very public and transparent uh, through the school committee meetings of what they're doing. And um, every decision and document that they put out is just very, con very clear, concise, and well done. And I got to tip my hat to them. So we'll, we'll just have to see, and people just have to keep doing what they're doing to keep the numbers down. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, the police station and the municipal campus, uh, the committee with Patrick Pitney as chair, um, they're doing an awful lot of work in a very short period of time. They really are, yeah. 
So they received the first cost estimate for the police station. Um, Board of Selectmen, through a vote a couple meetings ago, indicated that they're going to focus on requesting funding for just the police station aspect of this project right now. The committee still continues to look at the whole campus and get through the full scope of work that we signed a contract for earlier this spring. Um, but obviously we're pulling back on the scope of the project uh, quite a bit given the financial situation of not only the town but you know you know everyone in town the residents so um, yeah the committee's done a lot of work to both get up to speed on the design process that or design and needs of the police department and then really transition into how are we going to build it you know what procurement method are we going to use what's it going to cost um, and what's a prudent recommendation to make to the Board of Selectmen on the, along those lines. So. Well, there's nothing wrong with doing the projects in steps. Right. So, and you wouldn't want um, the major project to hurt what needs to be done with the police station. Right. So, with the police station, a lot of people are trying to be clear. Is the, the current station going to be demolished? It eventually would be. So, it can't be used for anything else? Well, we didn't feel that that was the best approach. Um, to be quite honest with you, that building is cinder block, bearing walls throughout the entire uh, building, and it was built as a police station. And so it's hard to really go in there and on a cost-effective basis, one, bring it up to code, which we would have to do, and two, reconfigure it into some type of new professional office or conference space environment you know so it was really it was considered right so if we need more uh, space for town and school offices on the, on the municipal campus can we use that and it, it you know it's just such a challenge you know the HVAC system's not adequate in it um, and uh, it's just not an easy process to go through so the plan is yes to tear it down but we'll get the benefit of it until we cut the ribbon. You know, we're not going to need swing space. We're not going to need to find a home for the police department until that new station is constructed. Um, the design has been managed such that the new building would be a sufficient close, but a sufficient distance away to allow us to continue to occupy that space until we're ready to open the new one. So not to be critical of the recent school buildings that were built without being brick. Will the police station be brick to coordinate with the yeah. campus or will you follow with what they've done with the schools? There will be both two aspects. It will be brick, to be very clear. It will um, match the town hall and, and be appropriate for this campus, just like the senior center is. Um, and the police station needs to be a fortified structure and not just from, you know, a, you know, terroristic or individual threat standpoint, but, you know, it's where our dispatching center is. It's where um, we'll be able to provide 24 seven emergency operations. It don't need to withstand natural disasters. It's gotta be the one building that's still there for us to function through heavy winter storms, hurricanes, who knows, you know, what we'll, we'll face. So um, the code for a building that's in that tier of, um, you know, public safety operations and critical infrastructure is quite substantial. And so brick is complementary to that. Um, and so it will be a brick building and it will serve both the aesthetic and functional uh, purpose uh, because of that. I um, noticed that I don't have his name. Um, oh, Kyle Amato represents the Lake Quinsigamon Commission. The now PD on that. As yep. a police officer. Correct. It used to always be that the chief was there and then a lieutenant. And I don't, I don't believe it needs to be. Yep. But I, I also thought it was, it, it's a good move to spread some of the responsibilities to the patrolman because um, it just shows the value of the people and the quality of the people that we have in our department. Yeah, so it's, it's you know, you can look at it a couple ways. We think it's a, a true benefit to have Kyle and, and other folks who are actually on the lake be able to interact with um, the commission, 
and favorite. answer their questions. <laughs> um, and also provides us the opportunity whenever the conversation gets to a much higher level to know that we have to take a step back and um, consult with the chief after the meetings and make the decisions and not be kind of pressured into, you know, uh, a knee-jerk reaction when dealing with, you know, longer-term or more comprehensive decisions by the Lake Quinn Sigmund uh, Commission. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a good balance. Uh, we like input at all levels for, throughout the organization. It's a model that we're really trying to push, and I think it's a good example. Um, Route 20 construction it started on Lake Street, has gone all the way down. Is it done? Uh, not quite yet. I was down there earlier this week. We're um, still doing some work, but we're, yeah, a lot of good progress. Um, being able to work during the daytime, less traffic, all those hurdles that we were going to have to overcome pre-COVID. You know, it's one of the benefits that <laughs> we've been able to move more diligently. Uh, got a good contractor out there, and uh, we're making significant progress in that expansion. And um, what's the timeline now for the Edgemere project or the Market Basket project? It's, it hasn't been delayed. They're still in their due diligence period with their comprehensive environmental permit. And um, a lot of conversations have still been ongoing with um, MassDOT, with Route 20. Um, we'll ultimately need to, and a decision has been made to turn Purinton into a cul-de-sac. So we need to think about underground infrastructure and the roadway surface itself. Uh, it's a big project and a lot of changes in that Route 20 corridor. And lowering the speed limit. Yes, they, they're, it actually already has been in some areas. Um, and um, we'll see what happens with that section. But yeah, a lot of positive um, things going on in the Route 20 corridor. Now the um, marijuana dispensary is open. Yep, the um, first one. Yeah, Vera Life, nine thirty nine Boston Turnpike. On People Route don't 9. even know it's there. Yep, that's a good thing. So right? that's a good thing. That's yep. a positive. Yeah, um, there aren't long lines. Um, yep. The a police officers present. Yeah, we've had a lot of close communications continuing with Vera Life, the 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 retail operator there. Um, they started off appointment only with, you know, number of police details and have evolved over time into a more conventional uh, retail operating model and they're finding success, which is a good thing for the town. Uh, look forward to that revenue this fiscal year. We'll get almost a whole year out of it, which will be great for planning and out years. Um, you know, on both sides, both the host community agreement, 3% funding and 3% that'll come in on the tax side, uh, which would be critical to all our operations given the other constraints that we have, so. Do you have any idea what that income will be for the revenue for the town? I don't know yet. You know, there were projections that, you know, roughly there, a community like Shrewsbury and the surrounding area would produce about $16 million in sales you know, net sales at the retailer, um, town would get ultimately about 6% of that. So um, it's still early, you know, they've only been open for about a month, but it's certainly on my list to follow up with them and see what the numbers are. They provide those funds both to us and the state quarterly. So um, not exactly sure when the, you know, the, the first report will be due, but I would say before the end of the calendar year, certainly we'll have a better idea of how their initial months of operations have gone. So and it'll take a while. You'll receive the revenue quarterly. That's correct. From That's how the host community agreement was established. So that 3% and then the state distributes all their state aid quarterly. And since it's a an excise tax, it will come in that way. And to be clear, the, the police officers working there are paid by, not by the town? Correct, directly by the retailer itself. When they pay for a police officer, does the town receive any money at the same time? Yeah, for I mean, that? there's a little bit of difference, about a 10% difference about our, the rate that we charge and the officer's detail rate. That provides us with the overhead of scheduling and, um, you know, the crews are going out there and all those things. So, yep, the, the town receives direct funding as well. Now, Main Street to Northborough, pretty bumpy road these days. It is, yeah. 
Um, that's due to um, a number of infrastructure projects that were that are that have gone on, mainly water improvements, um, all planned in advance of a complete repaving and reconstruction of that roadway by the state. It's a state-owned road, um, and we thought it could happen this season, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So next summer, we'll make sure we plan with the state highway division throughout the winter to make sure it's top priority for next summer and get it repaved. Well, because that's unfortunate because they, the road's a mess. Mm -hmm. And for the people that ride on that part of the road daily, mm -hmm. it's got to be a real frustration. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine, <clears throat> will that have any damage to the plows going down the street? Um, it's pretty much in the same condition as it was in la as last winter. You know, it does settle over time, but the contractor will be responsible for coming up and shoring it up before the, the winter. You know, any new work that was done this year, which there was some, and um, minimal, but it is it is a state roadway. Well, I can tell you they're bringing more business to the auto industry because anybody who needs shocks in their car, if they drive down that street, they're going to get them sooner rather than later because it is quite a bumpy ride. So, um, animal control, how is that working with the intermunicipal process? I think it's really good. Um, potentially some opportunities for expansion of that. You know, we do partner with the town of Westboro and Grafton. Um, Grafton and Westboro have more operational overlap. We're, we really just back that animal control officer up whenever Keith Elms, our ACO, is in a is available to back them up and vice versa. So, um, you know, that's, you know, we've been, we're a couple years into that intermunicipal agreement. It means, you know, in the past, whenever the ACO was out on vacation, we didn't, we didn't have an ACO, you know, so um, this provides us the opportunity for more consistent coverage throughout the year, it gives the ACO the opportunity to make personal vacation decisions a, a little easier. Um, but it, it's worked out very well, and we'll see where it goes in the future. But uh, I see it expanding versus contracting. And we got a new Council on Aging van? Yes, we received a, a new Council on Aging van. Um, came in, you know, another community wasn't able to maintain it through their federal grant program and responsibilities, and it gave us an opportunity to acquire it. Uh, at a very reasonable price that was actually covered by Chief Joseph once again. And um, so that allows us to replace our nearly 15-year-old uh, van. Maybe it's a little older than that. Um, and hopefully provide more reliable transportation. Transportation's one of the three key strategic priorities of the COA and their strategic plan. So. Um, yeah, that's a step in the right direction for that. So, can you pronounce Chief Joseph's last name? Turkanian. Oh, you can. I okay, can. I just wondered. Yeah. Um, he's been very generous to the town. Amazing in phenomenal person. ways. Yep. yep, amazing person. Very generous. Very thankful for his contributions. Yeah. Everywhere you turn, he he's had an impact. He's had an impact in this garden, from yes. what I hear. Yes. Yes. Um, the library, mm -hmm. signs all over, on our public buildings. So the fire department received a grant for PPE, yep. and I guess through Congressman McGovern, but uh, it also involves other towns. Yep. The fire department receives so many grants, it's hard to keep up, which is a good thing. Exactly. I have to thank, you know, the chief and his leadership and Deputy Chief Colby and honestly Mike Borowick, who's uh, a firefighter. Um, very skilled both in firefighting and in public administration. He has his MPA or is attaining his MPA and he writes, is the lead on all of our grant applications for them and this is just one of many that he's secured throughout the course of the year. Um, it, you know, is almost $50,000 in total for just PPE and we partnered with Westboro and Northboro. Um, to make it happen and um, we threw in a little bit of extra town funding as did the other towns and really rounded off that so we're well situated with what we have on hand both now and in the future so if there is a second surge uh, we'll be ready. Do you find that there's 
a bigger focus on the need for preparedness? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not a day that we don't think about future preparedness, not only what we're going to do throughout this winter, but how we will approach things in the future. Um, we've always been very well prepared, um, and sometimes it seemed a little silly with the level of preparedness that we had done. You know, we, we had pretty much, without a doubt, quarterly, but oftentimes more than that, emergency management meetings that have been shepherded through the, the police and fire departments, through emergency management directors, whether it was Steve Rocco in that position or now Deputy Chief Colby who, who has it. Um, we've always been very prepared. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud that we're prepared of right now as I look into the future is emergency dispensing for vaccines. Um, that comes in partnership with the Central Mass Regional Public Health Alliance. But we've done drills and planning, you know, last summer, as recent as last summer, about uh, being a regional distributor through the federal government even of vaccines. We, did, we didn't know what the next one would need to be. Um, but now we do, and we'll, we will be ready if, if it's through the public health model that vaccines are distributed for COVID-19. So um, is, is there discussion about um, Tripoli? Yeah, it, it, there is discussion. Luckily, it hasn't been very close to home yet. Um, they've done some spraying out on the Cape and in Plymouth, things like that through the Department of Agriculture. Um, something we monitor through the Board of Health once again um, on a day-to-day -day basis. We are they're testing for mosquitoes just like we did last year. I think we're benefiting. One way we benefit from the drought, right, is less mosquitoes. So uh, we take the good with the bad. And um, it hasn't been anything really in central Massachusetts. It's all been in eastern Mass at this point. But and we really should talk about the beetles, the Asian longhorn beetles. Yeah. There's still work going on in town. Yep, there will be for many years to come, still doing survey work. It's all been negative so far uh, in recent years, but it's something that the U.S. Department of Agriculture is, still has the lead on. I get a weekly report. Uh, it's all been good so far. <clears throat> Have you attended Food Truck Thursday? Not personally. Um, I'm proud of the, the success and the partnership that we've had with the private businesses. Um, we had a little too much success in the first week to meet with the governor, really? to meet the governor's uh, revised 50 person in uh, gatherings, but we kind of ramped things back down. We may expand uh, the locations to include some of the school sites near the center uh, in future weeks. Um, we found that four trucks on the town hall put us in a position where we were just asking for more than 50 people to be on site. So, yeah, we pushed that back, but I'm really happy. It's a unique thing that, again, hopefully is another silver lining that comes out of this, a partnership with those local businesses. Uh, you know, Shishka Berries and Say Cheese are two food trucks that are um, make their home, or the residents of Shrewsbury operate them. So uh, we're happy to have a really tight relationship with um, Jim and um, be able to uh, manage it, you know, that way. So we, the town has provided the space and the public health oversight, and we've given very clear direction to them on what we want to see and what we don't want to see, and they've managed it on their own. So That's it's a great, great partnership. And what about New Beal? Not a day goes by without work up there. I mean, it's moving right along. It's on schedule. It's under budget. It's all those wonderful things that we like to talk about. Um, you know, the building's mostly enclosed at this point. Uh, the brick is on site and uh, precast concrete's on site. Windows are being put in, so it'll be closed up for winter and a lot of work to go on the inside. Uh, but that's even progressing pretty well at the same time. So uh, you can start to see it take shape and take form. Uh, and some of the architectural uh, attributes of it are coming to light at this point. So um, good news on that front as well. And how about Old Beale? Old Beale will, uh, is a challenge related to COVID, to be quite frank with you. Uh, we have to spend some additional money and put in a 
external HVAC system to be able to turn the air over. It's just, it doesn't have air conditioning. It doesn't have forced air heat. It's all hydronic heating. So um, we're using our CARES Act funding and put in an external uh, system to turn the air over and make it safe. Uh, but ultimately the dis, uh, disposition of that is moving forward. We've set a final schedule really for the RFP process, put us in a position to make a decision next spring and be lined up for taking on the, moving to the new school next summer and disposing of that property, all, you know, hopefully on that same timeline. I've noticed on TV you've had meetings within the selectmen's room. Um, yep. Public so, meetings? Yeah, How does that work? Just the school committee at this point. Um, they've come back on site. It, it's worked very well. You know, they're able to distance. There's no public on site. So that gives staff and the school committee the ability to sit around a setup that we'd normally use for about 40 or 30 or 40 people. and. You know, there's eight or 10 of them in the room, so it's safe and it works out well. Um, I think we've had quite fine success with, the, with all the committees from a remote basis. And given that, um, the Board of Selectmen has chosen not to go back in in public or you know, on-site setting at this point. And I think they'll stay that way for quite some time. So um, yeah, I think it's working out well for them though. And we got to meet our new uh, Light Department General Manager yep. at town meeting. Yep. Yeah, Chris Roy is doing a wonderful job. I've had a lot of good, encouraging, forward-thinking conversations, so he'll be picking up right where Michael had left off. Big project laid out before him for fiber to the home. Um, had an interesting conversation yesterday, honestly, with the city of Worcester to try to help them troubleshoot their internet connectivity issues that they're having for their residents and things like that and the approaches that we take as an internet service provider so always happy to partner with the city and um, share what we do so i mean that selco fiber project joel maliver you know is our technical lead on it he knows what he's doing and that project's moving forward so we're already hanging fiber throughout the community trying to chip away at that five-year horizon that no one seems to like everyone wants it shorter um, that's our goal but uh, we'll diligently work and make sure it's done right. Uh, do you find with the people only being able to come in by appointment that that's working out okay? Yeah, quite honestly, there's very little appointments being made. Really? Um, yeah, so honestly, I've had a couple appointments made for DPW. Um, the vast majority of appointments still are with the town clerk's office um, for them to help people with marriage licenses and other vital records. This week has been pretty unique because we have uh, early voting on site. So the front doors are open for anyone that wants to come in for early voting. It's been steady, but never an overflow of people. But yeah, we're not seeing a lot of demand. I think people have done really well to change and adapt to make their payments via the mail and online and other means that the town has. We don't plan to change that very soon, although we'll likely be increasing staff presence on site, but we're gonna leave that as is for likely a few more months, so. With the primary election, do you uh, find that more people are doing mail-in voting? Oh yeah. I mean, I think we're up to between you know, we're probably pushing 7,000 ballots that the town clerk's office has had to mail out since the Secretary of State mailed it out, mailed it out in uh, early August. It's been a lot of overtime going on in the, in the town clerk's office for elections and registrations right now, I can tell you that. So a lot of volunteer work. A lot of volunteer work. Yes. Uh, as you look at all that overtime, will that have an impact on staffing when you do new, new budgets? I don't think so. We're going to have to manage it, you know, as a, you know, one year anomaly at this point. We'll manage it through the reserve fund and other means through the finance committee. And um, it's just something that we'll have to deal with. We'll see if there's any state or federal, I won't hold my breath, uh, reimbursement <laughs> for the additional work that we have to do. But, you know, Sandy Wright and her team uh, have done a great job to manage that huge influx. 
So, you know, it's one of the anomalies as far as staffing goes. The, the town clerk's office is, you know, greater than full staff capacity really for the last three or four weeks because of that workload. And the town clerk's office is a very well-run department. It sure is. Um, people know what they need to do. They know their business, and um, it's very professional. Yes. Yeah, and they've responded the same in the same fashion with these challenges. So, so um, you mentioned DPW. The Farmer's Almanac just this week, I think, um, made comments about a very cold, snowy winter. <laughs> Is your budget going to be able to handle that? Yes. Um, you know, the snow and ice budget was impacted a little bit, but we'll be able to manage whatever we have to do. I'm excited that funding was put into the highway budget to use a GIS based or GPS based um, study to look at the efficiency of our plow routes for both the roads and the sidewalks. And um, hopefully that pays off as soon as this winter. You know, we're still considering the timeline of what it will actually take, but if not next year, to, to reduce the time it takes for a single route and make sure that people's you know, streets are um, handled in a more timely fashion during those snow events. And um, before COVID, there was discussion about uh, improving sidewalks, adding sidewalks. Is that something that's off the table now because of the um, financial impact? Well, financially, I'm not sure if it was ever on the table. Oh. <laughs> There's been a lot of conversations and we know that it's desires of the residents, but I think that the fact that we really only use Chapter 90 funds to improve our roads and sidewalks, we have enough roadways that need attention that would preclude us from really expanding sidewalks. I understand the, the need in the community. It's something we need to focus on, but I don't think COVID is impacting whether or not we move forward with that. It's, it's something that was a financial challenge before COVID and we need a new funding source for that, but it's something that we'll explore. Are there state funds for sidewalks anywhere? Yeah, there's complete street programs and side, you know, um, shared spaces. It's a new grant initiative that was put out by the administration this summer, you know, with the restaurants and using public spaces like you see in the city of Boston. So there, there's a growing number of sources for alternative modes of transportation, including sidewalks. So we're excited about that. Has the revenue um, started to increase with uh, restaurants in, in the past month or two? Well, like I said earlier, we only see that revenue quarterly and actually no one's had to pay their meals excise tax unless they're a larger business really since the past since the spring i think the deadline is just earlier this week for that first payment or maybe it's not till september so i, j I really can't tell yet uh, we'll receive our next round of state aid funding in october and get a give us a better understanding at that point do you find uh, businesses struggling to stay open in town or have we seen the worst of it with um, the two recent ones because I'm heartbroken that Bed Bath & Beyond is closing. And we don't and get a lot of immediate data um, on restaurants except for if they have a liquor license and they would turn that in um, or something you know related to that. What about stores, retail? Yeah you know, we haven't heard that any specific closing outside of the ones that you mentioned that doesn't mean you know some smaller retailers haven't had the close up shop either temporarily or permitting but it's not something or, or temporarily or per permanently, but it's not something that we have a good immediate understanding of. My uh, grandson has had, from Connecticut, has had baseball games in Massachusetts recently. And he's had a couple of games, or a few games, that have been held at St. John's. So the people from his area, and, and actually the players are from all over different parts of Connecticut, um, have been very complimentary to our town. That a lot of them have made a big, um, a big point to impress upon us that we live in a beautiful town. And they come from some pretty nice places too. But um, I was very proud. Nice. And I have to say that um, 
as much as I view St. John's as a rival because I'll always be loyal to Shrewsbury High School, um, I was very proud to be there to see what their beautiful um, ball fields have developed into. Right. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we've got some good stuff happening in town. Sure. Yep. Uh, so this was our first hour show since March or February and it's been a fast hour once again, torturous for you because you had to listen to just me. But um, I'd like to thank everyone for watching, but I want you to know, come up here, there are so many butterflies over here, and, and I've been very distracted because they're all behind Kevin, and there's multiple butterflies flying around on the bushes, and if you notice me coughing, it's because once I sat near all of um, these beautiful plants, my allergies came out. But I'd like to say thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.